Ancient warriors dreamed of a long-range weapon that could pierce through a man and his armor with pinpoint accuracy. Such a weapon was created, one of the first handheld mechanical killing machines. Next on Conquest, how to win with the crossbow. Right, gentlemen, you're all skilled in various weapons, but the only skill you're going to need this time is the possession of one eye and two fingers. Let me explain. The crossbow. The Chinese had it by the 6th century BC, the Greeks used it by the 4th century BC, the Romans used it mainly in a heavy siege version called the ballista. After the Romans, there's no firm evidence of it until the 10th century AD, which is where we pick up the story. You're going to be taught how to use the various types of medieval crossbow, which is where you will need your one eye and two fingers. After that, we'll introduce you to the modern high-tech weapon, and you will compete against each other in a final challenge. In medieval times, the crossbow was recorded in 947 AD at the Siege of Senlis, where it caused heavy casualties. When the Normans invaded England in 1066, the crossbow went with them. Soon after that date, the crossbow became the major missile weapon in Europe. So how was the crossbow invented? Well, I think this is one possible answer. If you accidentally draw a bow with too short an arrow, the arrow can get hooked up behind the bow. Now, some early archer must have realized this could be quite useful. The energy of the bow is now stored. All I need to do is find some way of mechanically releasing that energy. Now, if I replace my arm with a piece of wood and make some kind of trigger mechanism to release the arrow, well then, I got myself a crossbow. The earliest medieval crossbow was called an arbalest. A short bow stave of yew or elm, often protected by skin, was lashed into a wooden stock or tiller. And halfway along the tiller was this rotating catch, the nut. This was made of brass or horn. At the bottom of the nut, there is a notch, and into that notch went the trigger, this Z-shaped mechanism here. The string was pulled back to engage with the nut. A little pressure on the trigger would release the nut and send the string flying forward. Now, the crossbow was loaded, or spanned, by placing a foot under the bow stave and, and drawing the string back onto the nut. The bolt was then placed inside the string and the whole thing was released by a touch on the trigger. So what was the advantage of the crossbow over the much simpler bow? Mike, you're an archer, you take my bow, there's some arrows there for you. Duff, take the crossbow, there's some bolts there. You can kneel down and rest on this. Now, from behind those hay bales over there, a head is going to appear at some point over the next few minutes, like that. And I want you guys, at point-blank range, to shoot it, all right? While Mike and Darth take aim and wait for their target to appear, Dan and Phil learn about the types of arrow shot by the crossbow. A crossbow fires a short arrow called a bolt or a quarrel. It's laid along this groove cut on the top of the tiller. And these are generally made of yew or ash. They have two or three fletchings at the back. Some of the fletchings were spiralled to give the bolt a spin in flight. Now this one is designed to punch through plate armour. A slightly longer, thinner point would be best against mail. And then there's a whole range of broadheads. These are for use against unarmoured soldiers and the need for hunting. The quarrels and bolts were kept in a quiver, a box that was hung from the belt. Any luck yet? Nope, not yet. Although the early arbalest was primitive compared to later, more powerful crossbows, the effect of this weapon on the battlefield was huge. It was absolutely deadly, especially at close range. This was a revolution in armament, as important in its day as the gun was to later generations. It was the first handheld mechanical killing machine. Just look at that guy over there with the bow. The hand bow required muscular strength and steadiness. It cannot be held at full draw for any length of time. Whereas with the crossbow... You got it. I just pulled the trigger. My arm was hurting and when I went to relax it, the target came up and I wasn't ready. 
Well, that's just the point. The crossbow was ready. And look at you. You have to stand up to use your weapon. You're an open target. The crossbowman can kneel behind cover and take his shot when the target appears. The crossbowman even had his own special type of shield. It was called a pavis. He would carry it on his back, move into position, and then set it up on this stand. Then he could span his bow safely behind the protection of the shield. He could then shoot it, still protected. Now, many medieval battles were sieges, and the crossbow was an ideal weapon either to attack a castle or to defend it. It just depended which side had more crossbowmen. The arbalest, once spanned, could be fired at leisure without effort. It merely required alignment and the correct elevation for the distance of a chosen target. But there's more. So, had you shot that crossbow before? First time. Well, why don't you all have a go? As I said, a good bowman needs physical strength and a lifetime of practice. But with a crossbow, anyone can be taught how to load, aim and shoot with reasonable accuracy in a very short space of time. This was the first really effective missile weapon to be widely available to common soldiers who were unskilled and who needed very little training. Most importantly, the crossbow could fire a bolt which flew faster, further, more accurately and with greater penetration than any archer's arrow of the period. In 1099, during the First Crusade, Anna Komnena, daughter of the Byzantine Emperor, wrote, They not only pierce through a shield, but also pierce a man and his armour through and through. The crossbow was subject to continuous development and improvement, especially in loading techniques. The first improvement was this, the stirrup fitted to the head of the tiller. This was placed on the ground, the foot was placed inside it, and this made the pull of the string much easier. As crossbows became more powerful, they required stronger methods of loading or spanning. The first of these was the spanning belt. This was simply a belt with a hook attached. The crossbowman places crossbow on the ground, kneel down, put the hook over the bowstring, and then he could use the full force of his body to pull that string up. A further refinement was to put the hook on a pulley, which moved along a cord. One end of this was attached to the belt, and the other to a peg on the tiller. The body pulled the string back as before, but the pulley gave a two-to-one mechanical advantage. From around 1300, the metal workers of Europe discovered how to make bow stays of steel, of relatively high resilience. Now, these were a great improvement, but they were expensive, and they required some extremely skilled metalworking. The bow stay was usually held in a recess cut in the front of the tiller, and it was either bound on with cords or secured by a system of braces and wedges. There we are. These more powerful crossbows required a much stronger spanning system to load them. Now, the windlass was a metal frame that attached over the butt end of the tiller. Connected to it was this drum with two winding handles, connected to a couple of cords and a whole system of pulleys. At the business end were these two hooks. They hooked over the bowstring, and then the windlass itself was wound up. The string is pulled backwards over the nut, and when it reaches that point, you want to check that the trigger is fully engaged. Now the windlass is wound down, to engage the bowstring onto the nut, and the windlass itself is then removed. Now, at last, you have a really powerful crossbow with a mechanical spanning system, a truly deadly weapon. As the crossbow spread, so did the horror that this weapon inspired. It wasn't just that it was so deadly, it was that now a common peasant could, at long range, pierce the finest male and kill a member of the nobility. It's not surprising that the knightly classes opposed this weapon. In 1139, Pope Innocent II declared, the deadly art, hated of God, of crossbowmen and archers, should not be used against Christians and Catholics on pain of anathema. Of course, Muslims and infidels were fair game. 
but no one could stop the use of such a great weapon. It was a favourite of King Richard I of England. He used it against Muslims and Christians alike. At the siege of Chalouz in 1199, he was mortally wounded by a crossbow bolt, which some saw as God's punishment. Coming up, our team learns to use the various types of ancient crossbow and gets to compare them with other weapons. Today, our team, dressed as mercenaries of the Middle Ages, practice loading and firing the medieval crossbow. The crossbowman played a pivotal role in many battles of the Middle Ages. From his position at the forefront and on the wings of the battle, his main purpose was to stop the advance of the enemy, especially cavalry. The main disadvantage of the crossbow was the slow rate of fire. Only two shots a minute from a really powerful weapon, but it had great penetrating power and accuracy. It remained effective up to 200 yards, though the penetrating power decreased with the distance. This could be a devastating weapon. In 1314, the Mayor of London raised a force of 120 crossbowmen. The crossbows cost 41 pennies, the baldricks 12 pennies, the quivers 3 pennies. There were 4,000 crossbow bolts at a bargain price of 240 pennies, a helmet and collaret of iron at 61 pennies, and a hackathon or armoured coat at 81 pennies. But you guys, the crossbowmen, were only paid four pennies a day. Four pennies? Well, what skills have you got? Oh, well, I can, I can aim and squeeze that trigger thing. Well, exactly. Anyone can do that. Now, your kit may have been expensive, but you guys were dirt cheap. In England, the crossbow had already been superseded by the longbow. This was the only weapon which had anywhere near the range and penetration of the crossbow. But the longbow needed a high level of strength and training that only the English achieved. But in Europe, the crossbow was perceived very differently. It was used by highly trained and well-armoured mercenaries. The Genoese, in particular, were renowned for their skill and steadfastness. Mounted crossbowmen were regarded as elite troops and often formed the personal bodyguards of kings. But medieval crossbowmen must have had problems with these old designs, especially the windlass. One answer is to make a faster loading crossbow. The Kranekin is a rack and pinion device. Inside this case is a toothed wheel which engages on this toothed bar with a double hook on the end. The bar is wound down to collect the string. It's then wound up again to pull the string back onto the nut. In this position, you ensure that the trigger is fully engaged and then you wound down the Kranekin once again. The Kranekin was removed, bolt placed in the bow. Now, the Kranekin was much more manageable than the windlass and because you didn't have to rest the bow on the ground, a mounted crossbowman could now use a much more powerful weapon. But it remained fairly slow to load, but now there were alternatives. It's time to try a test. Here we have the windlass crossbow, Kranekin crossbow. I will have a long bow. This is a short bow used everywhere. We archers would need years of training. Here's a handgun of about 1450 and a matchlock musket of about 1550. Now the firearms are complicated to load but relatively easy to aim and fire. We've got three targets. The first one at 20 yards, where we'll see which weapons can penetrate it. Next one is at 40 yards, which we'll see which weapons can reach it and how many can penetrate it. And the final one is at 60 yards. I want you to shoot, loose and fire as much as you can. Are you ready? Ready. ready. The team shoots at the first target 20 yards away. All the projectiles hit the armoured dummy. The guns make some nice holes, and the longbow and the crossbows are close enough to pick off the ideal target, the face. But the arrows from the short bow just bounce off. Even at this close range, this weapon requires a well-aimed shot to an unarmoured part of the body. So the short bow is eliminated. Next, the second target at 40 yards. After three tries, the longbow finally strikes the target. The matchlock hits with ease. Both crossbows are accurate enough to strike the target, but don't quite penetrate the heavy armour. The handgun is completely inaccurate and is eliminated. For the third target at 60 yards, my longbow should certainly be able to penetrate the armour, if I can hit it. 
I shoot plenty of arrows, but I miss, which eliminates the longbow and leaves the crossbows and the matchlock. The crossbowmen have to carefully adjust the elevation and allow for windage, which is the effect of any side wind on the bolt. One bolt actually does hit the target, but with so little power that it bounces off. The matchlock hits and punches straight through the armor. The crossbow loses out, making the matchlock the superior weapon. In its time, the crossbow was a remarkable weapon, but it was only really effective against plate armor up to about 60 yards. It performed just as well as the longbow in everything except the crucial rate of fire, but it required much less skill to learn how to use it. But neither of these weapons could match up to the growing power of the gun. With the introduction of firearms, the military crossbow was practically obsolete after 1550. From then on, crossbows were used mostly for hunting or target shooting by the leisured classes. Right, gentlemen. It's only in the last 50 years, with the introduction of modern high-tech materials, that the design, construction and power of the crossbow has seen revolutionary change. For you to experience the modern crossbow, we've come here to the Valley West Archers range. Take up a bow. Let's get to work. Otis Snyder, who represents Horton Crossbows, instructs the team on how to use today's state-of-the-art crossbows fitted with scopes, which help the shooter focus more accurately. Hi, team. Before we start to shoot the crossbow, there are a few basics you're going to have to pick up on. Number one, and probably the most important, is the safety. Safety is ambidextrous, left or right on the crossbow. Must be in the fire position to cock. Out front of the bow, there are grooves at the forearm and the crossbow. Those are for your thumbs and fingers. Keep them in there. Basic way of cocking the crossbow, step into the stirrup up to the ball of your foot. I try to put my chest right down on the stock, get my index fingers along the rail, use all four fingers on each hand, all the way back to the latch. Crossbow is then cocked, automatically goes in the safe position when it's cocked. The methods for spanning the crossbow are the same now as they have always been. The straight pull, the hook and pulley, and the windlass. But our team still has difficulties. Coming up, our team faced their final challenge with some of the most powerful crossbows on Earth. Gentlemen, time for your final challenge. We've set up targets at 20, 40 and 60 yards. Between 20 and 60 yards, your arrow will drop by six feet. Inside your scope, you'll see a heavy horizontal line. That is zeroed in at 20 yards. Each line below that represents another 10 yards of elevation. Work it out. You're going to shoot in pairs, two shots at each target. And the two guys with the winders are up first. Off you go. Although they will shoot in pairs, it's every man for himself. So may the best crossbowman win. Dan and Phil go first. Considering the little training they've had, they do okay. And both get two hits. At this close range, Mike and Darth seem confident. They also get two hits each. After target one, all team members are tied with two points each. Moving to target two, each team member has to deal with an increased elevation. The lines inside the scope make it easier, but their inexperience causes mistakes. Dan and Phil give it a go. Dan earns two hits, but Phil only gets one. Darth remains steady and gets two hits, but Mike only gets one. Six arrows out of eight hit target two. Dan and Darth are in the lead, each with four hits. Tension builds as the team tackles target three, the bear. Dan and Phil find 60 yards a difficult range, but Dan still manages to get two hits. Phil, on the other hand, only scores one. Mike lacks concentration and makes only one hit, but Darth maintains his focus and strikes the bear twice. The team doesn't know it, but there is no clear leader after target three. 
All right, guys, those are your fixed targets. Now for your surprise. You're going to have a moving target behind those hay bales across your line of fire. There'll be a mark for the bullseye. Whoever is closest to the bullseye gets double points. Shoot! The team has finished the conquest challenge. Now let's tally up the scores. All right, gentlemen, let's have a look at the ball. Right, this arrow is the closest and it belongs to... Darth, who wins the contest. Well done. Requiring a unique combination of human skills and mechanical artifice, the crossbow is a remarkable weapon. It's also a great modern sport, and our team have really enjoyed learning how to win with the crossbow. Whether it's ancient combat or modern sport, winning is what it's all about. I have to conquer a skill that I know absolutely nothing about. But how do you win? The history channel car is history! This man has learned the hard way. Now, he's ready to show you. How to win! as a combat archer when the ability to shoot fast and accurately makes the difference between life and death victory and defeat and what was it like to be shot at ah! when nothing could fly farther and faster than a metal piercing arrow ah! and you're weighed down by 60 pounds of armor ah! which side would you rather be on? the answer might surprise you. So steady your nerves, take careful aim, and learn how to win with the bow and arrow. Right, you all know what this is? The bow, the stick and the string. Now this is a great idea. Our ancestors invented and improved it over thousands of years. Now we are going to teach you how to win, how to win as combat archers. We're going to see how long it takes, how good you can get, and then we're going to pitch you against a full-scale assault by knights in plate armour. Uh, seems simple enough. But first, we want you to uh, follow your ancestors and make one bow and one arrow. And we have modern tools, we have flint for the arrowheads, we have string. We also have woods all around us, so go out, get yourself one bow and one arrow. Off you go. <laughs> go that way, guys. Go that way. Ah. The bow and arrow. So important in human evolution, it's been called the third invention, after fire and tools. When eating depended on hunting, it was vital for prehistoric man's survival. He needed a weapon that had range, accuracy, that could be prepared quietly, that built up its own energy, which could be released instantly. The bow became the most important and highly regarded weapon in the arsenal of early man. But just try making one of these things from scratch. Not easy, as our team members are finding out. For instance, nobody's told them what kind of trees to cut. You or ash are the best. They're not the most common of trees, but they've been the first choice of archers for thousands of years. And most of our people have gotten it wrong. Though I have heard the words, you ash, a couple of times. All right, guys, just uh, sit around and start working on them. I want to see perfect bows and perfect arrows within just a few minutes. All right, we're hacking away at our ill-chosen wood. We're braiding up our lengths of string. And while all that's happening, let's think about some napping. That's napping with a K, not an N. And it's all about flint, made into arrowheads. All right, gentlemen, this is an arrowhead. Well, actually, it's about a thousand arrowheads. Have you ever done flint napping before? No. All right, put some goggles on. 
Now, flint mapping is actually relatively easy to get it pretty good, but very, very difficult to get it absolutely right. Modern man is a clumsy oaf compared to his Stone Age ancestors. Their flint arrowheads were practically works of art. Later, when arrowheads were made of bronze and iron, a huge variety of shapes evolved. There were harpoon points for fish, blunt heads to stun small animals, and barbed heads to wound larger game and cause bleeding. But all of these would have failed completely if there were no fletchings at the other end of the arrow. Fletchings are feathers, leaves or whatnot at the arrow's tail, and eventually arrow makers came to be called fletchers. Think of that next time you turn to the F's in your phone book. Oh, Mr. Fletcher, I'd like to order... All we need now is a knock. That's without the K this time. It's what we use to marry the arrow to the bow. And with that, we're ready to go. All right, guys, this way. Come with your bows and your arrows. Right, you want to make a line back here? Let's try uh, yours. Let's <laughs> try that one more time. Try that one more time. Ah! Try that one more time. Ooh. Not bad. Okay, yeah. let's try the next one. You've got this really heavy arrow with a yeah, and I sharp... Yeah, if I run into a moose, this will probably do it. <laughs> you don't think yours is going to work? Oh, and I'll tell you why. Ah! <laughs> 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 this is the ninja bow. I see you've actually got some fletchings on there. And it's a really long arrow too with a pretty fearsome flint head on there. I figured if it, the, the bow thing doesn't work out, I can hit it with the arrow. Hey! Hey! So you see what a difference just those little fletchings make. Well, we've um, made all sorts of bows, some short, some long, some which broke immediately. Arrows of all types, only one with fletchings, and that one was definitely the best. So at least it's given us some appreciation of our ancestors. Fortunately, we won't have to meet our men in armor with the crude bows of prehistory. Next for the conquest team, winning with advanced technology, Middle Ages style. Left to their own devices, the team's success in making their own bows and arrows was limited, to be polite. Yes. Now we're going to give them some training. Come on, this way. And teach them how to win with the genuine articles. All right, guys, these are the real things. Long bows. This is what you've labored so hard to try and make. You need certain equipment with bows, and that equipment has stayed the same throughout history. First of all, as you pull the string, you're always going to need something here to protect your fingers. It's called a finger tab. It's a simple piece of leather. As we fire a bow, the string hits the inside of the arm. And after a couple of goes of that, it makes a real mark there and hurts. So you need a bracer. These were just pieces of leather or slate tied around the arm. So the bowstring would slap against them. Bracers, tabs, good bow and you're all set up. Right, we've got our equipment in hand. Bows, arrows, braces, finger tabs. Bows, braces, finger tabs. So now it's time to pull some strings. Bow strings. There were lots of ways to do it. The earliest was simply pinching the end of the arrow between your thumb and forefinger. When bows became more powerful, fingers curled around to help out. And some people, like the Chinese and Mongols, preferred their thumbs. The thumb hold, or the Mongolian release, was used by many Eastern cultures. In this, the thumb is wrapped around the string and locked by the fingers. As you draw the string back, it bites right into the thumb. So, you could use a thumb ring to make a smooth, easy release. And as many Asian warriors found, the Mongolian release was very effective. The draw we will use is the Mediterranean hold. One finger goes above the arrow, two below. To the left. We've enlisted the help of Steve Ralphs, an expert archer, to help teach our team. All right, whole books have been written about what we're about to do, shooting the bow, especially one in 1545 by Roger Ashcom. A fine fellow who knew all about archery, but nothing about television.
So let me summarize. Roger Ashcombe's five points. One, standing, solid, steady, arm out straight. Two, knocking, string in the arrows, knock, getting ready for three, drawing, quickly followed by four, the hold. A pause to be sure all is well. And five. Your first shot. Knock your arrow, draw your bow, and relax. We've got one arrow in the target. That's one, one out of ten. Arrow. Was that yours? Well, actually, yes, it was. It was. But, but oh. nevertheless, you've been reading Ashton. <laughs> <laughs> well, we never said this would be easy. But as we are finding, a basic level of skill comes quickly when we've had some chance to practice. It's only about half an hour later, and 50% of our team's arrows are hitting somewhere on the target. We're using bows of about 30 to 40 pounds. That's not the weight of the bow, that's the amount of pressure required to draw the string back to the anchor point. Now, the anchor point could be the chin, could be the side of the mouth. A really skilled archer would draw the bow right back until the string was beside his ear. After an hour, there is real improvement. Three quarters of the shots are now good. And we're beginning to think we can win at this game, except for one thing. The team is in agony. It's one of the major problems of archery throughout history. It was really difficult to find men who are strong and fit enough to be first-class archers. You need a huge amount of upper body strength. The strain on the chest and arms is extraordinary. You need a good health, a good diet, a good eye, and lots and lots of practice which is exactly what our team is going to get. But there's more in store for the Conquest team when we change the surroundings and show them what winning with the bow is really like. The team is practicing against targets on the archery range. And even if that's good for them, it can be pretty dull. Let's have some fun and give them a change of costumes and scenery and take them someplace where winning is easy. Now our team is in the middle of the woods. A place that has always been a natural habitat for the bowman and a very dangerous one for the armoured knight. In legend, Robin Hood is said to have made Sherwood Forest impossible to pass through without threat of ambush. It's not hard to see why. Armour is heavy and makes passage through the woods slow and difficult. The archers are after that intriguing black bag and won't think twice about killing to get it. Our bowmen have a tremendous advantage. They are much faster. They can run and they can hide. The prize is a fine set of armor, bound for a knight in a nearby castle, and worth enough to support these merry men for a year or more. <laughs> Individual archers with the best equipment could be extremely effective, especially in forests. But most medieval battles weren't fought in forests. They were fought on wide open fields where the commanders had control of their army and where the cavalry knights could ride to magnificent victories. Most medieval commanders used their archers only for the initial attack in a battle, for siege work or for mass volleys against dense targets. Archers were neither expected nor allowed to win battles. That was the job of the knights. The bow had a serious image problem. In medieval Europe, the bow was used by gentlemen only for the hunt. They scorned it as a weapon of war. It was unchivalrous, used by cowardly peasants and mercenaries. Most bows had to be cheap to make and easy to use, requiring little skill to achieve a basic ability. And most archers were just not valuable enough to feed well and train regularly. Still, Every so often, they did make a difference, which is why commanders bothered with them in the first place. As the Bayer Tapestry illustrates, William the Conqueror of Normandy had archers among his troops, while the Saxons of England did not. Until the later Middle Ages, the archer was the most despised man on the battlefield. But this doesn't make sense. Surely the value of this weapon is obvious. It's an absolute killer. Or is it? I want to show you two things. The first is my bicep. Now, I'm very proud of it. I think it's absolutely magnificent. But a medieval archer would laugh at that. The second thing is my suitcases. Now, this one here weighs 100 pounds, and this one weighs 50 pounds. And I can 
barely lift them up. The first class Warbow had a drawing strength of 150 pounds. That's about 50 pounds push with the left hand and 100 pounds pull with the right. Except, of course, this is only a 30 pound bow. If it was actually 150 pounds, I couldn't even draw it, let alone shoot it. Now, you would need a first class archer of great stamina, great strength, and who had trained all his life. Only the English longbowman came anywhere near that ideal, and he was the exception. England's archers, in fact, were the elite among the bowmen of the Middle Ages. They were so good because the English developed a culture of archery, in which young boys learned and practiced with powerful longbows from the time they could walk. Known for their strength and accuracy, the longbowmen of England became feared on the battlefield. However, our team is like the rest of Europe's combat archers. They were the army draftees of their time. They weren't that strong, their bows were not that powerful, and their aim was not that good. But at least they're getting better. Our team are well practiced now, feeling confident. But to find out how good they would be as combat archers on the battlefield, we need to give them a new target. A live target. Me. Today, I'm going to be shot at. Oh, oh. So I need some serious protection. Ever since the bow was introduced for warfare, armour has been developed to protect against it. But it's a balance of advantage. You can wear this heavy mail to try and protect against arrows, but it makes it more difficult to move and to fight. The usual arrowhead for warfare was this. The broadhead, wide and flat. Now this could only puncture mail at close range. But if it hit the flesh, it would slash a wide and deep wound. This head is long and thin. This was the one to use against mail. Now, I'm not taking any chances today, so I'm wearing full plate over the mail armour. And when plate came along, this arrow was introduced with a simple bodkin point that could puncture armour. Whatever the type of arrow you were hit with, if you were hit hard, then you were out of the battle. And don't believe what they say in the Hollywood movies. You cannot fight with an arrow inside you, but you can certainly die, which um, I do not intend to do today, so I'm putting on every bit of armour I can. Here's what I have in mind. Our ten archers are now up to speed. Like their medieval counterparts, they can shoot perhaps five aimed shots per minute at the straw target at the end of the range. But even a poorly trained lout could shoot faster if ordered say, 12 unaimed shots in a minute. A general volley like that could do well against a large target, like a mass of infantry or cavalry. The archer could shoot at his target in two ways, at an elevation and straight. In theory, the bowman could loose two arrows to arrive on target simultaneously, one up, one straight. Multiply that by 10 archers and you have 20 arrows arriving on the target within a few seconds of each other. Ouch. But a straw target is hardly the game our team is after. They've heard of my plan and after all I put them through, who can blame them for wanting a piece of my hide? Even if they are shooting rubber-tipped arrows and even if I am wearing 60 pounds of armour. They're incredibly close. Is that it? If you measure this... Ready! Prepare! Ready! Oh! Oh! No! Oh! 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 Let's hold it there for a moment, shall we? Oh! Before we go on, let's not forget that the armoured knight on the field worried less about archers and more about other knights on horses. So today's exercise, ten archers against lonely me, isn't quite complete. Of course, they won't be shooting at just one man. They'll be shooting at a densely packed mass of us. Come on! Now, we can stay spread out like this, but if we do that, our unit loses cohesion and strength. If we stay spread out, and they have any cavalry, well, they'll ride right through us, cut us to pieces. So, we have to bunch together. Form up. Now, in this closely packed mass, we at least have some protection against cavalry. But we're the perfect target for those archers. Any minute now, 
They're going to start rapid fire. Ten of them, firing one arrow every five seconds. In one minute, 120 arrows are going to arrive on the target, which is us. Shields up! On each side, the tension mounts as we wait for the battle to begin. Advance! Now, we have to stay closely packed together. As the arrows come in, we must keep discipline. We can't charge them yet. If we do, we'll arrive exhausted. We have to be fresh when we get there. One or two of us may go down, but most of us will arrive intact. And once we do, those archers are going to be made into soup. Charge! Now, in theory, archers should always have the advantage. They're light troops, highly mobile, they can pick off their target at a distance, provided they are first-class men with the finest equipment. But archers were usually poorly fed, badly paid, poorly trained, and utterly lacking in motivation. In theory, ten good archers should pick off those men before they got here. But it doesn't quite work like that. Because I'm scared, and I'm hungry, and I'm on lousy pay, and they're getting closer. And the man beside me has, has, has just run away, and I know that if I don't join them, then, then I'm going to die! So how do you win as a combat archer? You do it by choosing your own turf. Remember the forest? There, the trees acted as obstacles to hinder the knights and give the archers plenty of places to hide. On open ground, you'd need to have extraordinary skill to win against armor. The kind of skill that requires a lifetime of training that our team just didn't have. First-class archers, like the English longbowmen, could decisively win battles. But they were the exception, not the rule. Archers needed discipline, training, respect. Most importantly of all, they needed protection. A force of cavalry or infantry who could move in to screen them from attack. Throughout most of history, they got none of these things. They simply weren't considered important enough. Our combat team have learned to shoot the bow in a very short time. They've also learned something else as well. If there's one place on the medieval battlefield that you don't want to be, it's among the archers.